Vanessa, thank you so much for joining us. This topic that we're talking about, this is personal to you. I know you've been crusading against a lot of this for a long time, but recently it has got personal because you're going through something right now. I don't know how much you can or want to say about it. So I'll leave it up to you. What do you want to say? Well, first of all, uh, Rob, thank you so much for inviting me onto uh, your podcast. Um, it's lovely to be able to speak to somebody such as yourself, who's such an authority in our sector and has such credibility. So I really appreciate you giving me the chance to talk a little bit about this, because as I'm sure you're aware, the narrative has attempted to be controlled uh, by the claimant who is taking um, legal action against me. And I guess the bottom line is that I am facing the biggest defamation claim in the history of UK courts. Um, 5.4 million alleged damages, uh, greater than damages awarded to Colleen Rooney or uh, Chris Packham or any of these really, really major celebrities who were awarded 40,000 and 90,000 respectively. Mm -hmm. um, so I, yes, um, I am being taken to court for defamation, mostly for fact-checking certain claims and also a number of um, falsehoods that were said about myself uh, where I wanted to set the record straight. Um, but defamation law in this country unfortunately favours those with very deep pockets and you have to be taken to trial to prove your innocence and that can cost um, into the tens, hundreds of thousands of pounds. And that's why I started my crowd justice campaign, which you very kindly agreed to link to, because that kind of details the whole um, background of the case, how it came about, um, and it's all been legally approved by my legal team. So I can talk about um, what we've mentioned on the crowd justice page as well. This, on a personal level, must be quite something to go through because i i know you're you're not afraid to sort of stand up for what you think is right and you've been doing that for a very long time but to have someone come out after you and presumably that like, if you were to lose the case the the financial penalty the financial outcome of that would be disastrous what's it actually like going through this experience it, it's it's very very frightening um because it's very complex um, uh, legalities. Defamation law is one of the most complex and expensive types of litigation that there is. Um, very, very few uh, defamation cases ever reach court because about 99% of them are settled out of court because they're so long winded and they take so much to get to trial. Um, you know, we, we're talking into uh, the, the millions to take this to trial and um, my um, defence budget to defend myself all the way to trial is somewhere in the region of, of 650,000. Wow. Um, so when is it going to come to court, do you know? Well, it has to go through a number of uh, processes which start with preliminary hearings. Um, this case was brought in um, 20. 21 and we finally got to the first hearing in March this year which was known as a meanings hearing and um, this was a half day hearing not a trial just a hearing uh, where the court looked at what I'd allegedly said um, and decided what I meant by what I said uh, and that, that was done actually between the two barristers involved and um, we only went before the judge to say we've been through it all outside of the court and we've, we've come to an accord on, on what I meant and what my defences will be if it goes to trial. So um, I was very, very fortunate to have um, Jonathan Price representing me, who is one of the top defamation barristers in the UK and he's very um, famous for working uh, with defendants who he believes um, have had a false claim against brought against them. Mm. And so when it does eventually come to court, how do you how do you prove that you haven't defamed someone? Well, there's a long way to go um, before it's going to get to court. And there's been some recent developments which I, I can't actually talk about, but um, it, it may never get to court 
there's a lot of stages to go through. Uh, and um, Jonathan Price um, has helped me um, to find a way where it may it may never come to court and um, that will involve a, a different type of hearing which I've made an application for. Um, the case will be stayed until that point so there'll be no further activity on it and it's likely that my hearing won't go before the court until the autumn so it's so so long to wait with mm. this hanging over me but you know I'm very, very delighted that Mr. Price has, has taken on my case. Yeah. So it seems like you've, this seems, as far as I'm aware, this is the first time there's been anything of this scale in this sector in terms of, uh, there's been lots, lots of th threats made against you, against property tribes because of some of the content on there, which has un been unhelpful to certain people. Um, but I'm, has anything like this happened before? I'm not aware of it. No, Property Tribes has a very robust and proven moderation procedure that is fair and impartial and, ad and adheres to all um, of the requirements of the defamation operators of websites 2013 regulations. So Property Tribes um, and neither myself nor Property Tribes have ever had any case um, reach, reach a court. Uh, and be, being served uh, our, our moderation procedure and how good it is has always protected uh, everybody on property tribes because it's, it's not just me it's our 75,000 members who could attract defamation proceedings so I think that really shows that uh, you know property tribes has got a very very good track record of, of fair moderation um, and has never ever faced uh, any kind of um, you know, uh, legal suit up until this point, and we've been going 14 years now. Mm. Yeah, well, in a very strange way, it's a compliment because it shows that what Property Tribes is doing is important, right? And people pay attention to it because it's the fact that pe people don't want certain things to be made public on there because then people go and do searches and, and it comes up and it's not good for business. But um, perhaps not as damaging to business as it should be, but we can come to that later. Yeah, um, I think I'd like to, to add, Rob, that we're the only forum that allows substantiated commentary. Substantiated commentary is, is not defamatory. We're the only forum that's ever allowed it. Uh, no other forums, probably quite sensibly, that they won't take on the legal threat of having a defamation case against them. Mm. Um, and I think it's really important to understand that anybody can say uh, that something is is defamatory about them so i could say so and so has got a big nose and that person could take me to court for saying they've got a big nose uh, and that could cost me seven hundred and fifty thousand pounds to defend myself and this is why there's a huge movement um, within the government and also something called the anti-slaps coalition to stop these cases being brought because they they're called strategic lawsuits against public participation slaps uh, and they are brought to shut down commentary that is in the public interest and i'm being supported by um the free speech union uh in this regards in fact um you know they've even promoted my crowd justice uh campaign page to their membership so um I, I think this could really be a landmark case. And as you inferred earlier, it's never been brought before in the property educator sector. Um, and it could be a, a platform for, for positive change. And, and that's what I'm hoping that the good that will come out of this will be, that there it will provide additional awareness of the issues in the property educator stroke property guru, YouTuber influencer space. Um, and also, you know, be a platform for positive change. Yeah, fair play to you because you're right. Everyone else has shied away from it, us included. But we had our four, but it's not going near that. I just don't, don't need that at all. So it's good. Glad I'm glad someone is. Um, I'm glad someone is willing to sort of put themselves out there and take the consequences that come. Uh, but this is 
this sector is not new, so I'm glad you said property educator because I wasn't sure how to refer to this whole sector. But I think that's probably the best way of of framing it. Um, but it's always been around. It's been around as long as I can remember. Uh, how has it evolved during that time? Well, first of all, there's nothing wrong with education. It's absolutely vital in property. And Nick and I are massive supporters of what we call authentic education, uh, education that gives the upsides as well as the downsides and is based in reality, not fantasy. And I would in include you, the two Robs, in the authentic education sector Thank you. because you give out good quality, credible information uh, and, you know, you're not saying that somebody's going to be a millionaire in a year with no money, uh, which is what the other side of what I call the wealth creation industry does. And these um, these kind of uh, educators, I call it buying a ticket to see a unicorn because they're selling something that nine times out of 10 doesn't actually exist. And that nine times out of 10, the person that's bought into this and paid thousands of pounds for a course won't be able to achieve in reality. So uh, there's good sides to education. And then there's the side to education that is really uh, um, what I would call get rich quick. Uh, and that uh, the only only person that's that's really making money from it is is the property guru himself or herself because they're taking large sums of money off multiple people because they have such a massive reach through social media um to actually create uh you know they, they've got various kind of groups and mentorships and academies and things and people go into these uh, and then they find that they can't make it work um and then of course because it's unregulated uh they're in very few routes of redress to try and get your money back or uh, or so on um and then that that's another issue uh to, to be associated with with this type of property guru training um the mm. unregulated nature of it makes it very dangerous to to consumers i'm going to try and put forward the best possible version of what their argument would be uh, so i'd say like well of course it's possible i've done it look at these three people who've been through my training they've done it anyone can do it obviously not everyone's going to do it not everyone who goes and does a university degree ends up going going on and getting a fantastic job you can't control that as the teacher that's the best the most generous version how do you respond to that well i would say um the fact that three other people have done it is totally uh, irrelevant unless you stay, say what their starting point was. If one of them's won the lottery and has a million pounds in cash, the other one is a city hedge fund manager and is on a salary of 500,000 a year, and the third one has had an inheritance of five million pounds, then of course they're going to be a success. But the vast majority of people are starting in property um, or the people that are attracted to these courses, should I say, the vast majority of them um, are not in those kind of very favourable financial situations. A lot of them are in difficult financial circumstances and they're looking for an answer. And then they're exposed to all of this content on YouTube um, where the narrative is controlled very much by the trainer, controlling all the comments, deleting any negative comments, uh, and putting across this amazingly rosy picture of how easy it is and how it doesn't take much money and all of this kind of really emotional stuff that pulls people in and gives them hope for a better future. And that's one of the things I find so sad about this is that a, a lot of people have their hope for the future absolutely crushed when they realise that they've essentially lost their money and they're not going to be able to achieve what they were told they would achieve. And they're actually in a worse financial position than when they started before they met this property guru. And I receive communications every month from people who have suddenly had that light bulb moment that, that they're not going to be a millionaire. And they, they feel everything from ashamed to absolutely feeling bleak, having no hope for the future, having let their partner down, having spent their pension, 
uh, you know, it, the, the stories I hear are just, they're, they're heartbreaking and, you know, something does need to be done about it and it does need to come under scrutiny and there does need to be some, some kind of regulation to stop financial loss. Mm. And I think it's worth saying that uh, it's very natural, I think, to feel ashamed or like you're at fault if you fall for something like that. But you shouldn't because it is really compelling like the 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 way that it's marketed is really well done i feel like in in property i'm kind of a bit immune to it so sort of i know too much and so it's so it's like well no clearly not but then i sort of i come across th things in other industries i don't know so much about and it even gets me for a minute going oh wow that sounds great and then you kind of go oh, actually if it sounds too good to be true it probably is but i don't think there's any shame in coming across something it all seems credible like i kind of alluded to it's often technically possible it's just not very likely and not nowhere near as easy as it's made out to be mm -hmm. um so it's very easy to, to to, to go go into that and then it's only later when you go oh yeah actually it's not going to happen no nope, you're, you're absolutely right and as i say i, I get calls every week I, I have become some sort of focal point for people that feel that they, they've lost money in the wealth creation industry because i have been trying to create awareness and provide due diligence resources about it um, myself since Property Tribes started in 2009, but also obviously the Property Tribes community uh, creates a great deal of resources because a lot of people come to it who are a dissatisfied client of uh, Mr. Property Trainer and they want to let the community know what happened to them mm. uh, and maybe try and get some help getting some redress, but also to, to warn others that uh, about this individual or this company and how they were treated. So, you know, Property Tribes itself is community generated um, content. And a lot of the content about property trainers is created by dissatisfied students. But the person bringing the court case against me would have you believe that I created every single thread about him on Property Tribes. And again, that's controlling the narrative you know, trying to say that I'm somehow obsessed with him because I created all these threads. In reality, I've, I've created two threads about him, one of which was a live blog of the Joe Lysette Got Your Back segment on Channel 4, where I literally wrote down what was happening in the programme. And I, that's part of the defamation claim against me that I live blogged Joe Lysette. Um, and the other one was in response to uh, uh, one of, I think, 13 videos that he's made about me over the past few years, um, where he said something that was so incredibly out of order that, that I, I had to retaliate and set the record straight. And part of my fact checking there has also formed the basis of his defamation claim. I think we need to talk about what people individually can do to protect themselves from this. But on a okay, or legislative level, I can't say that word. But on a legislative level, what should be done? Because it's not just property. You get the same thing in any market where there's money to be made. It's, it's, re it's but there is nothing to stop anyone from saying anything pretty much and, the, and even if there are sort of theoretically consequences the chances of actually getting into trouble for it are pretty slim can what should be done can anything realistically be done it can and it is um, the good news is that the online safety bill is going through parliament at the moment uh, and that uh, is going to uh, put much more onus on um, social media uh, platforms to remove content that uh, could be uh, defrauding people or scamming people. So they're going to be held much more accountable, which I think is, is a very good step forward. How effective it will be in reality, I don't know, because I've found these places to be fairly impenetrable, um, you know, when it comes to uh, trying to get stuff removed. I've tried to get you know, stuff removed about myself that was extremely harassing and distressing by by the claimant. Um, and, you know, you never hear back from them. They just just goes into a black hole somewhere. 
Um, so there's that happening. Um, there's, I think there does need to be some form of regulation and the government is currently looking um, to, to regulate rent to rent, which I think is one of the key areas uh, which is causing financial loss, in fact, to landlords because so many inexperienced and badly trained people are going into it and causing financial loss, actually both to tenants and landlords. Mm. So that's a step in the right direction. Um, also, that the banks are uh, being held much more accountable for payments that turn out to be to uh, fraudulent um, uh, products or services. Um, and this is being enforced now as I speak. So in the future, if you feel that you've been defrauded and the, the kind of definition of defrauded is that you've lost money to somebody who, who didn't give you what they contracted to give you and they've become more wealthy or richer as a result. That is the definition of fraud. You can look it up on the Action Fraud web website. So there's going to be more enforcement of banks having to uh, refund um, people that have handed over money that turned out to be um, a fraudulent transaction. Uh, and then I guess what I would like to also see is um, some form of regulation, uh, you know that some people talk about getting an FCA regulated because a lot of these gurus give financial advice and they're actually not qualified to do so. Um, so there should be some some form of 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 of, of uh, you know financial advice. Um, I'd like to see more resources about how to do due diligence on property trainers. I've created loads of them, but you know property tribes is a small space in a very big ocean not everybody's going to find their way to it so the whole uh, ethical part of the wealth creation industry can play a part in this and create resources on how to do proper due, due diligence and um, and you know if in doubt just go on to a website uh, uh, and ask for some advice uh, and be be mindful of the method as well um, you know if it looks too good to be true or sounds too good to be true I'm, I'm sorry, but it is going to be too good to be true. There's there's no exceptions to that ever. Um, and, you know, you need to keep alert um, to, to any red flags that you see about this company or the individual that you're thinking of handing money over to. And if you have to go ahead with it, please read the small print on the back and don't be rushed into a pressurised situation saying, oh, we've got a special offer today and we'll reduce the price by £10,000 if you join up today. Don't don't fall for that. You as a consumer have, a, have many, many rights and you should make sure that you familiarise yourself with them and make sure that, that you, you uh, take advantage of all of your consumer rights. Mm. In terms of due diligence, I find it amazing that there's for certain individuals, not talking about anyone in particular, but for certain individuals, you can just go and Google their name or the name of their company. And there's so much bad stuff, like absolutely tons. Um, some of it from very credible outlets, or sometimes it's just the volume of it because there's stuff in forums all over the place. And still, it doesn't seem to stop large numbers of people doing business with them. Why is that? Um, I think it's partly because people don't put um, that person's name or company name into Google. Um, the whole sales process of these people is extremely sophisticated and it's designed to break down any barrier that that individual may have about handing over money. So it's a very specific process that somebody is taken on in order to get them to sign up for one of these courses. Um, so first of all, they probably don't um, do any due diligence, which is, you know, very sad because, as you say, that there's a lot of information out there. Um, and also, I think because the, the narrative online is controlled by, by these trainers. And certainly since my court case started, um, you know, I, I can't talk as much as I would like to about, about what's going on. So essentially 
the few people that were willing to talk about it um, have have been silenced by these court proceedings because there's another group of seven people who were all um, on a Facebook group about the same individual that's suing me. They're also um, being sued for defamation in the High Court alongside my me. Nothing to do with me, but this individual has brought two massive cases to the High Court. So uh, they've kind of, um, their group has not been able to, uh, you know, create so many warnings about property training because it wasn't just about this individual it was about the whole sector mm. so anybody that does stick their head above the parapet is often shut down uh through legal threats um and you know every every month i hear from people that have um you know gone onto social media said i'm not happy with x property training company and they've received a, a legal letter threatening them with defamation mm. so they don't want to face a defamation quite case quite understandably so they've deleted their content so the um the 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 youtubers and the instagrammers and the tiktokers they can all control the narrative on their own channel for instance um you know on the videos that have been made about me hundreds of people wrote comments in support of me and they were all deleted whereas all the people that have never got a clue who I am never bothered to check anything all their vile defamatory comments about me were allowed to remain so that the narrative is very much controlled um, and this is why property tribes is so important to our sector because it's just an independent platform which allows freedom of speech essentially um, and this is why uh, I am being supported by the free speech union and also index on censorship in 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 my case because they clearly see this as uh you know freedom of speech being shut down when the comments that i have made and uh you know the information that i've shared um has been very much it not only truthful but but in the public interest and also based on my experience of being a landlord since 1992 so um this is why you know i'm very fortunate to have these organizations uh, uh supporting me and as i say in, in public in the case of the free speech union yeah and is there more of this around than there used to be do you think because you used to have to like go and like book a conference room in a hotel and put adverts in the paper or whatever and people were doing that like back when i got started uh, but now you anyone can just like sort of create an account on TikTok and say whatever they like so do you think there has been an explosion in this type of content let's say 100 percent. i mean the social web has facilitated these people um getting a very very far reach and reaching tens hundreds of thousands of people um you know you can you can buy youtube views you can uh buy comments you know it, it it's it's it creates a false illusion online um that does suck people in and the algorithms if it for instance sees that you're interested in property the um the online algorithms will just start feeding you more and more of this guru type content and they also have budgets to pay for it yeah. so they can dominate the, the online streams because they've got so much money from selling courses um rather than perhaps investing in property uh, that they're able to control uh, the narrative to to some extent um one thing they can't control is property tribes and they don't like that mm. um and you know it's not just uh the claimant in this case uh that says you know defamatory things about me about property tribes about my husband about our community a lot of the other names do as well um, and over the years we've been threatened we've been uh, we've had late night phone calls um, you know it's it's very unpleasant that there, there are big bucks at stake here and uh, you know people don't want their gravy trains being upset um, and they will likely stop at nothing to 
you know, try and control the narrative and try and shut down anybody that's, um, you know, commenting about them. And in my case, uh, the individual concerned has had a BBC documentary expose of him. He's had four articles in The Telegraph exposing him. He's had a Joe Lysette segment exposing him. He's had exposure by the New, State, New Statesman, Navarra Media, um, and so on. And, um, you know, he hasn't gone and taken legal action against, against them. He's come and taken legal action against little old me. Mm. And you have to wonder why. Indeed. Um, so let's try and help some people. So let's say you you do get something comes into your world that sounds sounds quite appealing. Um, you do the basic step of googling the name. You find a couple of things. People seem a bit a bit um, bit unhappy, but you know, not, not, no one's perfect, and no one no one ever goes away from anything completely happy. To okay, like maybe I don't know what I should think about this. What other Kind of type, what other due diligence should someone be doing or what red flags should they be looking out for? Uh, I think uh, one of the, the, the best options is to look at public domain um, financial profiling, which would be uh, Companies House or sites like Endelay. Um, they actually show somebody's true wealth, whether they have any property holdings, because even if those property holdings are bought for cash, they would be on the balance sheet of the company. Uh, most of these big players in the property sector, if they have portfolios the size that they claim, you would expect them to be held in a lim limited company and you would be able to identify those assets within the limited company. So those are really, really good uh, places to look. But also, I think, to look at the method, method of the people and see if it's following a certain track into a marketing funnel where you're offered something very low cost or free they get hold of your data and then they start relentlessly marketing to you um, saying you're going to be wealthy you can do this and um, don't listen to the naysayers uh, you know come along to our course get signed up you could be living a different life in a year's time you know and it, as i said it's so seductive and it's so sophisticated and these people are that they're brilliant marketeers I, 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 you know, that they're, they're, they're just brilliant, but it's a shame that they're using it in a, um, you know, in a not so, uh, uh, should I say, method of integrity uh, to, to bring people into their marketing funnel. And the sole point of these marketing funnels is to upsell people to more and more expensive products. And very early on, once people get into a marketing funnel, uh, by various means, they will be identified as somebody who can be rinsed for more and more cash. So they'll be made to feel special. They'll be told, you've got what it takes. We've got a inner sanctum group you can come and be part of. You know, it's £15,000. You know, we've noticed you're, you've got it. And, and they will be groomed to spend more and more and more money. Uh, and the more that they become invested in it, the more that they feel invested in it and the more they're going to be in denial that maybe they've been had. Mm. So they then start getting other people to come on board uh, because very often they're offered, you know, I know one trainer that offers 500 pounds for every person that you introduce and who actually buys the the premium value course so then these people are thinking oh I've lost my 13,000 I only need to you know sell to a, a handful of people and I and get 500 pound commission per thing and I can get my 13,000 back so mm -hmm. you know it's almost like a pyramid to be honest um, and the guru is sitting at the top and all the the money is flowing to, towards him uh, and then it's filtered down through his lieutenants and his trainers uh, and all the people that are his staff um, and people that I would call enablers who, uh, you know, go around enabling everything that he does and trying to control everything that's said about him and so on. So it's a very, very effective um, setup, to be honest. Mm. Uh, and it's understandable why, why people can fall for it. Um, and it's just the sums of money involved uh, that they can be quite significant. There's one mentorship that costs a um, hundred thousand pounds. 
you know, and if you hand over that and, and you don't get what you paid for, uh, you know, that that's life changing. And you, you've just got to be on, on your guard. You've got to be sceptical. Um, Scepticism, there's, there's nothing wrong with, with it. It's critical thinking. It's what could go wrong here. What could the outcome be if this doesn't work out? I, I know there's prospect of better regulation and so forth to come. But as you say, the, the wheels of justice turn, turn slowly. have been waiting a long time. So it seems to me that whether that happens or not, the best thing you can do is protect yourself and think about what could happen if things go wrong. And that's mm. sort of something that I heard very early in property. As someone said to me, which is stuck with me, is like whenever you're having a conversation with anyone about entering into anything, it's great. It's, it's lots of fun to sit around having conversations about how great it'll be when everything works, but have a dedicated conversation where all you do is talk about all the things that can go wrong and how you'll manage them if they do and that's it's it's something that you always sort of like almost like touch on in, in passing but you should have a dedicated conversation about it and see if you're if it is something you want to do because mm. no one ever wants to think about the downside well they don't uh, and, and this is a, a lot of what these property gurus prey on um, they only want to focus on the upside they don't tell you the risks, they don't tell you the hurdles, they don't tell you the pitfalls. Um, and many people fail at the first hurdle and they realise that, that they've been had uh, and that they're in a worse off financial position. Um, and, and many will just disappear with their tail between their legs because they're ashamed, they're embarrassed, they didn't tell their husband or their wife or their partner. Um, and so the marketing funnel continues onwards, sucking in more and more people like a, a giant hoover um and yeah i mean it is it it it, it, it the, people say well why do you care maybe you shouldn't care and may, maybe i shouldn't but i think about it could be my my sister my nephew my niece my parents my best friend who who experiences financial loss and Financial loss isn't just about the actual money that that you lose, although that is devastating enough. It's actually about the mental anxiety and stress that it causes. It can send people into a very, very dark place. Mm. And, you know, perhaps with my court case, the universe is, is saying to me, this is your purpose. Your purpose is to shine a light on these nefarious activities and somehow bring in greater consumer protection uh, going forwards to stop people uh, losing money uh, and having their, their future massively impacted by, by financial loss. Um, and I, uh, Nick and I have both discussed this at length, as you can imagine. Um, and we have both said we want this, what's happening to us, we want it to be greater than just us. We want it to be for the benefit of, of the whole property community. Um, and that's the way that, that we're approaching it. We want it to be for the greater good. And if we have to go through this process to bring about change, then we're prepared to do that and in fact we don't have a choice because you have to defend yourself in a defamation case if you don't uh, you'll get a default judgment against you and we I, you know i'm quite happy to defend myself um and i know my legal team uh say that i've got you know very strong defense um and they're 100 percent behind me helping me see it through so um just, you know, when you go online, don't get your information all from one source. Go everywhere. Ask lots of different places in lots of different places. Get multiple inputs. Try them all on. See what that resonates with you and then make up your own mind. Don't be led by, uh, you know, a singularity, what I call an ego system. That's what all the property gurus run. They run an ego system. You get into it and you're only exposed to their view. You're not allowed to hear any alternative views. 
you're exposed to their doctrine, uh, you're exposed to their philosophy of life, you're told that that's best, the best way to achieve what uh, you think you can achieve. It's, it's a very unhealthy place, actually. Whereas if you go on to property tribes and property hub, that is an ecosystem. So it's lots of different people creating lots of different content and there isn't a singularity and there isn't a singular narrative. It's just everything all at once, all the time uh, that you can get impartial advice from. I, I don't want people just to listen to me. I want people to go and ask everywhere in all the Facebook property groups, uh, you know, their solicitor, their mortgage broker, Ask on property tribes, of course, ask everywhere you can, landlord association meetings, events, you know, get as many inputs as you can. Uh, and that's what's ultimately going to protect you in, in property period, um, because you're going to mitigate your risk by actually getting all the inputs, forming your own view uh, and creating your own opinion on something rather than being told what you should think so go into much healthier environments um, don't hang out in these ego systems where there are you know boxing matches and big shows of giving to charity and um, you know just so much ego stuff big mansions big cars you know pictures with private jets uh, you know those are all ego systems they're very very unhealthy places particularly for people that are quite naive, perhaps young, not very experienced in business, um, and who don't know the right questions to ask. Completely agree. And we see it in property because it's where we are, but it happens everywhere where there is money to be, be made. And if social media has magnified the problem, which um, I'm sure it has, then social media has to be the answer as well. Because you have to kind of count, counteract it and put information out to help people to let them know what they should be doing. But it needs people like you to actually do that and take it on. So thank you for, for everything that you're doing. And, uh, and Property Tribes has been an amazing resource for the property community for a long time, and I'm sure it will be for a long time more. Well, thank you so much, Robin. I, I do appreciate you, you hosting this for me. And you, you've given me a, a voice and a chance to give an alternative view of the narrative that's being portrayed about me online by the claimant. And I also feel that your knowledge, you've asked the, the, the most amazing questions that I could wish for you to ask to help me um, establish my, my points. Um, because, you know, it does take in-depth knowledge of our sector to fully understand what's going on here. And um, I just want to say I'm incredibly grateful to you uh, and the other Rob um, and your whole team for, for letting me come on um, and giving me a chance to, uh, you know, have a voice uh, and to speak out against um, a narrative that's being portrayed about me online, which is, is grossly unfair, um, very unpleasant, has very unpleasant harassment and def defamation undertones, um, and it has just been relentless for four years. And I'm very much looking forward to my day in court where um, I can bring all this to an end.